All right. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Can you uh, see a slide that says lecture one introduction? Somebody give me a thumbs up or say yes. All right. Fantastic. So welcome. This is uh, CS189. It's the CDSS offering. And uh, in the interest of time, let's jump right into it. I'm using a slightly technical setup. Um, so if anything looks buggy or doesn't show up correctly, uh, just let me know and I'll, uh, I'll try my best to fix it. So let's start with core staff. And as a disclaimer, uh, I know that some of you may have questions about enrollment and nobody on core staff really knows anything about enrollment. It's not controlled by us and we don't uh, influence it in any way. So if you have questions about enrollment, please do uh, send an email to this address and uh, they're best equipped to help you. So we have six wonderful TAs, um, as well as two head TAs, Sean Lin and Ishan Srivastava. Um, and I see that there are a couple of TAs here. So uh, Ishan is here. And then also I see Frank and Sean O'Brien. Um, and you'll get to meet all of these TAs uh, or the TAs that you end up interacting with uh, as the semester goes along in discussion sections and office hours. And they're the ones that are really running the show. Um, especially Sean Lin and Ishan will be uh, your primary points of contact if you have any questions related to logistics or anything like that. Uh, they're the ones that are charged with all of that. There's also a great group of readers. So I see uh, Christy's here. I don't see any other readers, but if you're here, feel free to turn on your camera and wave. Um, readers will also be holding office hours and they'll also be uh, grading all of your homework. So be nice to them. There's also me. So I'm Marvin, and you can call me Marvin. Uh, I'll be giving the lectures, uh, and that's pretty much it. So first, for some basic general course information, uh, the course website is up and live, and you can go check it out at that address. Um, if and when we're permitted to, this course will return to being in person. So tentatively, that's scheduled for the end of the month, Monday, January 31st. Uh, but we'll see how the situation develops on the ground. Uh, and by in-person, I mean fully in-person. Lectures will be in-person, discussions, office hours, and especially exams will be in-person as well. Um, so do uh, take note of that. There are some prerequisites to this class that we feel like are relevant to mention. So the first one is it's a good idea to have a strong background in probability. Uh, that means that you've taken something like CS70 or STAT 134 or something similar. Uh, or you're willing to work really hard in order to beef up your probability background. A strong background in linear algebra and vector calculus is also very useful. So this includes classes like Math 54. Uh, but a lot of the times, uh, vector calculus is, for some reason, just something that people have to pick up on their own because there's not really a great class for it here. Um, but an example of what we might do uh, in terms of something that's related to vector calculus is, can you take the gradient of a matrix vector product? And if those terms don't make any sense, it might be a little bit more difficult, uh, but we'll also go over this in a little bit more detail next lecture so you'll have a better idea. Strong programming skills in Python is also quite useful. We'll have quite a few coding assignments. Uh, it's not exactly as heavy uh, on the coding side as uh, Professor Shuchuk's class, um, but it is still a decent amount of coding and being able to learn new libraries quickly is, very, is going to be very useful uh, in order to be able to complete the homeworks uh, 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 swiftly. And you can check your background with homework zero, which I believe was released right before this lecture or is going to be released very shortly, uh, and discussion zero, which will happen next week. I assume all of you know that lectures are at this time. So they're Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 1 to 2 p.m. Uh, and they're on Zoom for now uh, at this link. So you found it, so uh, I don't need to post the link. Uh, and hopefully, uh, you know, if, if the situation improves, there'll be an Evans 10 uh, when we go back to in-person. Lecture recordings will be available sometime after the live lecture. Uh, I believe this lecture is being recorded and all lectures, uh, whether remote or in-person, will be recorded. That being said, I take no responsibility if there are technical difficulties and the recording uh, you know, sucks for some reason. Um, there's uh, no saying, there's, it's always possible that something like that could happen. 
Uh, there may be some guest lectures, uh, which may not be recorded. Uh, whether or not they're recorded is up to the person who is giving the lecture. Uh, and sometimes we choose not to record them because it's nice to come and listen to a guest lecturer speak. So they're taking time out of their schedule to do that. I don't really mind if you don't come to every single one of my lectures. I know I talk a lot, um, but it's very nice to have uh, a, a good attendance uh, when there's a guest lecture. The lectures from Professor Shuchuk's offering of this course will differ in both content and ordering. So 90% of the content is the same. However, there are some slight differences in what we choose to teach. And the order in which these concepts are presented is also different. So you can't just make up for one of these lectures by going to Professor Shuchuk's lecture. It's going to be pretty different. And you might have no idea what's going on because he's talking about something completely different. One thing that I'm hoping to do, and this will you know, be up to whether or not it's supported technically, uh, is uh, mixing slides with board work. And by board work, I put this in quotes because um, it's writing directly on the slides and hopefully it shows up correctly. If it doesn't, uh, then we might have to come up with something else, but hopefully this will go through without a hitch. And both the slides and the annotated slides with the board work will be posted after lecture. Uh, Non-annotated version, uh, I will strive to post before lecture, uh, and the slides here are already posted on Piazza. Um, and so I'll try to do that before every lecture, and then, and then after every lecture, post the annotated version. Um, so I'm not looking at the chat. Is uh, someone else like Ishan, are you monitoring the chat? Yep, trying to answer things for now. Fantastic, thank you. Let me know if there's anything that uh, I should answer out loud. I see. I Otherwise, good. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I said yes, sounds good. Fantastic. Oh. Okay. Discussion sections and office hours. So, uh, all of the discussion sections and office hours will be posted at this link. I believe they're not up yet, uh, but we'll try to get that up by the end of the week as uh, discussions and office hours start next week. So you're encouraged to attend any discussion that you like that has room. Uh, and most of them, if not all of them, will have room. Uh, so you're free, you're, you're free to shop around and see if there's a particular TA uh, that you like uh, and then attend their discussion section. For office hours, it's very, impo it's very important that you read the policy uh, that uh, I believe either has already been posted on Piazza or will be posted soon. Um, and they include some of the following key, uh, they include the following key points along with some other key points that you should read. Uh, it's important to come to office hours prepared and with reasonable expectations. That's the way that you're going to get uh, the most help. You should actively look for other students that are working on the same problems because it's not necessarily just uh, uh, you know, a TA or a reader that can help you. A lot of other people can help you too, especially students that are working on the same problems. And if the office hour is busy, uh, then you'll be limited to a 10 minute window because we're trying to help as many people as possible. And please don't go to any discussions or office hours for Professor Shuchuk's class. Uh, they might not have the capacity to support you. And again, the content and ordering is different. So you might be uh, pretty confused if you show up there. OK, so now let's talk homeworks. So there are seven homework assignments total, uh, and they'll be released, uh, roughly speaking, uh, every other week. Uh, so there's exceptions like spring break and stuff like that. But for the most part, we'll stick to the schedule. And you'll have about a week and a half to complete each homework. So they'll be released on Wednesdays and then due Sundays. And we'll try to stick to this as closely as possible. So we won't accept late homeworks, uh, but we will drop your two lowest homework grades, uh, which means that you only actually have to complete five out of the seven homeworks. So the remaining five homeworks are each worth 10% of your overall grade, which means that homeworks in total are worth 50% of your grade. You're encouraged to discuss problems uh, with people in your study group or just anybody in the class, uh, but your code and your write-up must be your own. Also, anyone that you discuss homeworks with should be explicitly acknowledged on your homework write-up. And if you infract on this, uh, you'll receive at least an immediate zero on the assignment. 
And Homework Zero, like I said, is already out. So you can go to the course website and download it and already start looking through it. Um, I believe it's out, at least. Uh, someone can correct me if it's not, but uh, it should be. And if not, it will be released very shortly. So the other big part of your grade are exams. There's one midterm and one final exam, and these will both be in person uh, if, if we're allowed to have, to have them in person. The midterm is worth 20% of your grade, and uh, the, date, the date, time, and location are already finalized. So it's Wednesday, uh, March 9th from 7 to 9 p.m., and there's no lecture on that day. The final exam is worth 30% of your grade, uh, and it's Tuesday, May 10th, 8 to 11 a.m. I know 8 a.m. is not great, uh, but that's the time that they gave us. They have yet to assign us a location, I believe. And the midterm location is Donnell 145, uh, and we'll see about the final exam location. There are no alternate exams. So if you miss the midterm exam, your final will subsume that part of your grade. So it'll be worth 50% of your overall grade. If you miss the final exam, you receive an incomplete grade, which you can, you can then resolve next semester. And exam infractions are really serious, and they will result in at least significant points deducted from that exam, uh, which is a significant detriment to your overall grade just because they're worth so much. So in this class, homeworks are worth 50% of your grade, and exams in total are also worth 50% of your grade. That's your entire grade right there. And please do not go to the exams for Professor Shuchuk's class. Not only will you be kind of confused as to what's on the exam, uh, you also won't get credit if you take it. I guess that's the only thing I can say. Okay, so as a final note about logistics, let's talk about grading. So this- Marvin, before be that? Right. Yes. Yeah, useful question from the chat is that, is there a midterm club or policy for students who do attend the midterm, but let's say do better on the final by some definition of better? Is there a midterm clobbering policy? Uh, we have not established one, uh, but we can, let you know about that over Piazza, let's say in the next couple of days. So this course, this course will be curved uh, at the end of the semester after all of the grades have been computed. So no, we do not know what that curve is going to be, uh, but it will likely be curved. One thing that you should not assume is that the final grade dis distribution will necessarily follow historical precedent. Uh, for example, any particular previous semester of the course, any particular previous instructor of the course, uh, I answer to only one entity and that is the department. And the department has stipulated that this is the rough guideline that courses should follow. Uh, and so this is what we're going to follow uh, and please don't expect otherwise. So that is the end of the logistics portion. So I'm also happy to take any questions if anybody wants to ask out loud, or if there is a question that should be bumped up from the chat, I'm also happy to answer that. Uh, I've covered this a little bit on Piazza, but I think um, if you, students may want to hear a little more directly from you about the differences between our offering and Professor Shuchuk's offering of 189. Beyond sure. just let's yeah, say I the difference. In... Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as we've mentioned already on Piazza, uh, this version of the course that I'm teaching will be quite similar to last semester's version of the course. Um, and there are naturally differences between the way that different professors teach these classes. Uh, but one thing that you should note is that this class isn't being changed in any significant way because it's for data science students. It's still very much CS189, uh, just a particular version of CS189 that has, uh, his, you know, has already been taught at least once and it seemed to go pretty well. Uh, so as mentioned on Piazza, this version of 189 happens to have, you know, slightly less programming and slightly more math than Professor Chuchuk's version. Uh, but you, sh you shouldn't expect that there are any major differences that stem from the fact that it's for data science students. Uh, it's very much a computer science class, uh, and, and we will uh, try to follow last semester uh, as, clo as closely as we can, which means a decent amount of math, but also a, you know, a, a non-trivial amount of programming uh, that uh, you know, students did seem to find fairly challenging last semester as well. So, so that's roughly speaking what you can expect.
we have time for one more question if anybody has one. Fantastic, let's move on. So now let's actually get into uh, the introduction for this course. So what is machine learning? So here is a wall of text slide that I'll try to introduce one at a time. Uh, and it might be a lot to look at right now. Uh, hopefully you can also review the slide later on. And uh, you know, after we've talked about more examples of, of machine learning, it'll uh, all start to make sense. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I would assume that many of you uh, with your backgrounds would probably actually uh, latch onto this slide fairly easily. So machine learning has three core components, and these components are the model, uh, the optimization, so the way that the optimization is done, uh, and the data. So the model is, you know, at its core, a function that goes from some inputs to some outputs. So, the, so you know, the inputs and the outputs are defined by the data. They're defined by the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, but the key thing is that this function, unlike, you know, other computer science, uh, you know, notions of a function, it's not programmed by hand. So we're not programming this function. Instead, this model has parameters that we're going to try to what we call learn. And by learn, what we really mean is optimize. And so the optimization algorithm is the thing that's trying to learn or find good parameters. And we'll talk a lot about different types of optimization algorithms and, and, and what they do. But roughly speaking, we call parameters good uh, if they fit the data well, uh, if they can explain the data that we've seen. So the data typically, uh, but not always, consists of input-output examples. Uh, so examples of uh, what we want our model uh, to be able to represent. Uh, we'll see examples in this class of data that doesn't look like this, but for the most part, this is what our data is going to look like, input-output examples. And the goal really at the end of the day is for the model to generalize to new data that it wasn't fit on. So we don't really care if the model uh, is doing really well at you know, representing the input output examples that we've seen already if it can't do anything else. It has to be able to generalize uh, to new data that we haven't seen yet. So there are different types of machine learning problems that kind of fall into this overall paradigm that we can, that we can talk about. And here are two examples that do not represent an exhaustive, li an exhaustive list. So there's regression, which I'm assuming that many people here are already quite familiar with. The idea behind regression is you have some inputs, uh, and then the outputs that you're trying to predict are real values. Uh, and you're basically trying to say, can I guess what that real value output is, the target, uh, from uh, the you know, inputs that I'm given? Uh, and so here's an example of 1D regression, right? You're just trying to predict Y from X, uh, but regression can take on you know, much higher dimensions, which is, uh, you know, something that we'll also get into in this class. Um, and there's also another type of machine learning problem that we'll focus on a little bit more, actually, which is classification. So in classification, the output that I'm trying to predict is not a real value. It's like one of K different things where K can be, you know, some number depending on, uh, you know, what the problem is. So here, it's an example of binary classification where K is just two. Right? I'm just trying to distinguish between these green O's and these red X's, right? And then what I'm trying to do is learn a model uh, that can you know, take in my input and then predict, is this a green O or is this a red X? Uh, and that's what we're trying to do here. So actually, let's take a minute and talk a little bit more about what a model could actually look like for classification. So whenever you see this little blackboard icon on a slide, this is a slide that I'm going to be writing on. Uh, and like I said before, everything that I write, all the annotations uh, will go up as another version of the slides on Piazza after the lecture. Uh, if I can make this work. Okay, great. So here we have an example of classification uh, where essentially what we call the decision boundary, the, the, you know, the thing between the O's and the X's is represented by a line. So this is like a linear classifier is what we call it, right? So how do we actually represent a linear classifier? What does that model actually look like? Uh, well, let's say that you know, here I have uh, you know, two dimensions in my input. I have x1 and I have x2, right? Can everybody see that I'm uh, writing on the slides that's showing up properly for everyone? Give me a thumbs up or something. Okay, great. So 
I have X1 and X2. And then from X1 and X2, I'm trying to predict, is this thing a green O or is this a red X? And I'm doing so with a line. Well, how do I represent a line, right? Well, one way that I can represent a line is uh, I have X1 and X2. And then this line can be defined by uh, essentially, uh, you know, numbers that I multiply onto X1 and X2 plus a bias term. Uh, and, you know, it's a slight algebraic manipulation from like the MX plus B that everyone's familiar with, but it's essentially the same thing, right? Where I have some theta one and some theta two. I'm drawing this in blue to denote that it corresponds to this blue dotted line. And then also some bias theta three, right? Now a line I can define as theta one X one plus theta two X two plus theta three uh, equals zero. Right, that's that's what can correspond to this blue dotted line as long as I define theta one, theta two, and theta three properly. Right. So then, what I can conclude from that is I can represent this entire region that I'm going to classify as green O's. I can represent that as the region corresponding to this thing being less than or equal to zero. Okay. So that corresponds to the entire region of green zeros uh, that I'm going to be predicting. So basically, what this, what this function, what this model ends up looking like, if I wanted to write it in code, I could write something like, if this is true, if theta 1 x1 plus theta 2 x2 plus theta 3 is less than or equal to 0, then what I'm going to return is a green O. If that's not true, what am I going to return? Well, that means that I'm in the portion that lies above that line. So I'm going to return a red X. So in a sense, what we're doing here is we're really just writing programs. We're just writing functions, right? Functions that go from inputs, which are my X's, X1, X2, to outputs, which is, do I predict a green O or do I predict a red X, right? The real difference here is that the function is what we call parameterized because it has these additional thetas uh, that essentially we're trying to fit or learn uh, using the data, the examples that we're given. So a model is really just a parameterized function. And typically the way that we'll write it is some function f that takes in an input x, right? But then it also is parameterized uh, by something that we call theta. And then that returns us you know, some y which is, uh, you know, in this case, a label that we're predicting. You'll also see it written this way, where we can have f of theta as a subscript. And then that way, it's a little bit cleaner that it just, you know, takes in an x and then gives us back a y. OK, so here's an example of what also, uh, here's an example of two things. The first is an example of what a model could look like in machine learning. And then on a slightly more logistical note, here's an example of what a lot of this board work that I'm going to be doing in this class is going to look like. Uh, and so if there were no technical difficulties there, that's quite good. And then we can, uh, we can move on and uh, stick with this setup. But if there were any difficulties, do let me know and we can try to figure out something else. So now let's talk a little bit about examples of machine learning problems. Uh, and, you know, maybe if you want to, you can answer out loud. You can also answer in the chat. Uh, try to figure out, are these examples classification, regression? Uh, maybe they could be either, or maybe they're neither. Uh, try, to, try to answer in the chat or out loud. So a good example is recognizing digits. Um, I give you an image of a handwritten digit, and then you try to tell me, you know, is it 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 9? Are you seeing correct answers in the chat? Maybe I'll just open up the chat as well. Yep, the, the, the yeah, they've so far. Fantastic. Yeah, so this is a, a bona fide example of classification uh, that we'll also talk about a little bit later in this lecture. Determining whether or not an email is, scams, is spam. So I give you the text from an email, and then you try to tell me, uh, is this spam or is this not spam? All right, so I see a lot of classification. Yes, this is actually binary classification, just like we were seeing before, right? Maybe the red O is, uh, or sorry, the O is not spam, and then the red X is spam. Uh, predicting the price of a stock six months from now. Yeah, so it might be uh, better modeled as a regression problem because price, we often think of as a real value. Uh, 
uh, that might be a better fit for this particular problem. Uh, predicting the rating of a movie by a user. I see a lot of regression. I also see some either. I see some classification as well. Yeah, that's very interesting, right? So it kind of depends on what the rating is represented as, right? So the rating is the thing that you're trying to predict. That's the output, right? Is the rating some number of stars between one and five? Uh, is the rating a percentage? Uh, these types of questions matter when we're designing machine learning problems. And then after you pick these answers, uh, you'll have a better sense of uh, you know, should I model this as a classification problem? Should I model this as a regression problem? Uh, it depends pretty crucially on these, on these types of questions. Determining credit, credit worthiness for a mortgage or credit card transaction. I would like to make a meta note here that, uh, you know, sometimes machine learning applications can be a little bit troublesome. And I think that we have to be very careful as researchers and practitioners about what we apply machine learning to and how we apply machine learning. So we don't want models uh, that represent the implicit biases that we often find in data because data was generated by humans and humans have implicit biases, right? So when we're doing applications like this, we must first ask, should we do these applications? And if we decide that we should, we should be very careful how we actually proceed with them. Uh, but back to the tip at hand, uh, if we were trying to determine credit worthiness, would we think of this as a classification, regression, either or neither? Classification seems like a good fit. Uh, if we're just trying to have a binary, uh, let's provide this loan or let's not provide this loan. And so on and so forth. There are many, many examples of uh, machine learning problems that we can provide. Let's talk a little bit about not a real example, but a synthetic example of classification that comes from uh, really the seminal textbook by Hasty, Tipsharani, and Friedman called The Elements of Statistical Learning. This is not required reading for this class, uh, but it does make for a good supplemental reading if you're so inclined. So here's another example uh, that's from the book of binary classification. So you have these points in blue and then you have these points in orange uh, or gold or something like that. Uh, and if I were to try to learn or fit a linear classifier uh, between uh, these blue and gold points, uh, this is the linear class. This is one example of a linear classifier that I might find. Um, and what we can see right away is that it seems to fit the data okay, but not great, right? Like there are definitely a decent number of gold points that are on the wrong side and also a decent number of blue points that are on the wrong side. So then this lends the question, a linear classifier, it can do some things, but overall it still is quite uh, what we might think of as weak in the sense of the types of uh, decision boundaries that it can represent. Um, so what we might think is, well, maybe we want a classifier that's slightly more expressive is what we usually call it in that it can better represent the data that we've been given. Uh, and, and that way it'll be a better function, a better model for the data. So if we took this example and we said fit a different classifier, what might it look like? Well, another example uh, that we can use is what we call nearest neighbors classifiers. And the basic idea behind nearest neighbors is this, this, uh, this general sentiment of, I will judge you by the company that you keep. So the way that nearest neighbors works is that whenever I'm trying to classify a particular input, what I do is I try to, is I go and I find the closest example that I was given. And then I just predict whatever the, whatever the label is of that example. So we can see that, you know, in most regions, uh, you know, it, this classifier looks pretty sensible. Like, you know, there are some, you know, orange, do there are some gold dominated regions uh, where the closest point is, is, is gold. And there's some blue dominated regions where the closest point is blue. We can also see some weird things like these little islands of, uh, you know, there's uh, one gold point amidst a sea of blue points. And uh, that, you know, that gold point then occupies a little bit of space uh, because, you know, it happens to be the closest point in that area. But you might think, well, maybe that's actually not super accurate. Maybe that goal point is an outlier. Maybe it's noise. Uh, maybe someone collected the data incorrectly. So that's not actually something that I should pay attention to. So then it's kind of weird that in that area, I'm actually going to be predicting gold when I really don't want to. Uh, so then there is a slight twist on this idea of nearest neighbors, uh, which is to just use more neighbors. So we can say something like, for example, let me use the 15 nearest neighbors. So I'll compute the 15 closest points uh, to each, uh, to, to whatever input that I'm trying to 
classify, and then I'll take a majority vote. And then whatever the majority vote comes up as, I will predict that label. And we can see that essentially intuitively, what this ends up doing is it has this kind of smoothing effect uh, where there aren't as many sort of outliers that affect our prediction anymore uh, because the outliers are kind of dominated by the general trend that we see in the data. Uh, we can also see something very important, which is that clearly this classifier, uh, it looks like it's representing the data pretty well and it's nonlinear, right? So it doesn't have the same uh, limitation as the linear classifier that we saw where um, you know, it does represent these nonlinear decision boundaries that seem to get at the general shape of what is gold and what is blue. Okay, so this is a, a very quick preview as to what nearest neighbors classifiers look like, and we'll see this uh, in a little bit more detail later on in the class. Can I ask a question really quick? Absolutely. Um, so uh, this is like my first time doing machine learning, and I was curious for this example, what are the things like that we're deciding and then the, I guess, like the machine decides? So before we could see that the linear classifier didn't work well, but did we choose to make it a line? And then if not, how did like the computer decide? And then how can it decide how many thetas to include, like how many parameters and then what they should be? And then how do we decide, or do we tell it to like not overfit? So what do we predetermine? That's a great question. And uh, you know, it's everybody's first time doing machine learning. So uh, questions like this are, are very welcome. So we are the ones that are deciding what the model is going to be uh, that we're going to be trying trying to fit. So we decide, am I going to use a linear classifier? Am I going to use a nearest neighbors classifier? Am I going to use something else? Um, that's a choice that we have to make beforehand. And oftentimes that choice comes from uh, you know, either inspecting the data and taking a look at its general trend and saying, well, what might be a good fit here? Or it might come from uh, in, you know, biases like, oh, I really like neural networks, so I'm going to try and use a neural network to fit every piece of data that I have. Uh, sometimes that's a thing that happens as well. Um, after that, um, the, the, the model kind of takes over, right? The optimization, I should say, kind of takes over where it's like, okay, um, you've decided that you want to fit a line. I'm going to try and find you the best line that I possibly can, uh, but I'm limited in the sense of I'm only allowed to fit lines because that's what you told me to do. Uh, does that help answer the question? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Any other questions? There's also a concept that we're gonna talk about a little bit later on in this class called uh, a Bayes optimal classifier uh, or a Bayes decision boundary. Uh, and basically, the way that you can think about this classifier is that um, there's no better classifier that you could find than this one. And actually, you can't find this one generally. Um, so if you read the little caption that goes along with this figure, uh, the second sentence says, since the generating density is known for each class, this boundary can be calculated exactly. What does that mean? Well, what that means is that this is a synthetic example, right? So someone defined some distributions, I think like a mixture of Gaussians or something like that, that generated all of the blue points and all of the gold points. So essentially in this world, they're God, right? They know what the data was generated from uh, and therefore they don't have access. They don't only have access to the data. They also have access to the process that generated the data. When you have access to the process that generated the data, sometimes what you can do is you can compute this optimal classifier, this Bayes optimal classifier uh, that, does, that does the best possible job at uh, predicting uh, outputs given inputs. And by best possible, what I mean is uh, it might still make mistakes. I mean, there's inherent noise in this process, right? It's a random process. So you might not always be able to predict the best label exactly, uh, but it will make fewer mistakes and incur lower loss than any other possible uh, classifier that you could that you could try to define. Now the issue, right, is that in almost every real 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 world application, you don't have access to the process that generated the data. If you did, there's probably a lot of great things that you could do, like compute the you know Bayes optimal classifier. But usually we're restricted to just examples uh, in, these type, in those types of real-world applications. 
Uh, so unfortunately, this is a very interesting theoretical object to consider, and we'll talk about it a little bit in this class, uh, but it's not usually practical to think about whether or not uh, we can try to compute or achieve this. Okay, so that was a synthetic example. Now I wanna give you a real example of uh, a very successful machine learning application, which is digit recognition. Uh, and this image that I have here, uh, our images are examples, actual data points uh, from a data set that's called MNIST. Uh, and MNIST, I think, comes from the US Postal Service or something like that. They scanned a lot of handwritten digits uh, and then tried to use that to essentially build a model that could recognize these handwritten digits, which would then be able to automate the procedure of reading zip codes that people had written on letters. Uh, and actually, this was extremely successful. So, you know, the Postal Service does not read the zip code that you write on an envelope manually. Uh, it's all automated using this type of digit recognition machine learning software. Um, so MNIST in particular has what we call a training set of uh, 60,000 examples. And so this is a data that's provided to us in order to try to learn or fit our model. Um, and then a separate test set of 10,000 examples. So we'll talk about the distinction between training and test a little bit more uh, in a little bit more detail. But the basic idea is uh, you use your training set to fit your model, to learn your model, and then you use your test set to try to evaluate how good is the model that I fit or, or learned. And the reason that you need to do this is because if you learn your model on the training set, presumably it's going to do quite well on your training set. But remember, the goal was for the model to generalize to new data that it hasn't seen. And we can't use the training set to determine generalization because that's the data that we use to train the model. So we have a separate test set that we do not train on that we use to evaluate generalization, uh, whether or not the model is actually doing well on data that it wasn't fit on. Each digit in this MNIST data set uh, is an image, right? It's a, gray, it's a grayscale image of height 28 pixels and width 28 pixels. And the test error rates of the best machine learning models or systems uh, that you can build uh, for this data set uh, achieve errors of less than 0.5%, which means that it makes mistakes on the order of one in every 200 uh, examples that you give it, um, which is actually really quite good and probably uh, on the level of human performance, if not better than human performance, because there are there are just examples that are very ambiguous based on the variability in human handwriting. So for example, if you take a look at the column of eights and you look at the second to last eight uh, counting from the top, right? So the second to last eight from the bottom, uh, I would classify that as a zero because I don't see the top circle. That looks a lot more like a zero to me. So already in, you know, 50 examples I've done, I've classified one incorrectly, right? So I've, I currently have a 2% error rate. Um, so getting an error rate that's under 0.5% is, is really quite impressive and, you know, essentially makes this a model that's actually very useful in the real world, uh, which is why everybody cares about machine learning right now, right? It's because it's very useful in the real world. And, and that's why, probably why you're learning about it. Let's talk a little bit about what a model might actually look like for digit classification. Or let's give an example of what a model might look like if it was linear and whether or not it's a good idea, right? So we've already seen that in the synthetic example, a linear model was not a good idea. It didn't really fit the data very well, right? Could a linear model potentially fit digit classification well? And here, I won't provide a full argument, uh, but I'll provide some intuition for why it might not. So let's consider you know, a particular digit. It's 28 pixels by 28 pixels. Um, and, you know, what it might, and, you know, to give some intuition about that, right, if I zoom in to a particular patch of the image, uh, say like a four pixel by four pixel patch, uh, I didn't draw this to scale, but um, if it's, you know, a four pixel by four pixel patch, you know, if you zoom in on it, it might, you know, look like a four by four grid of, uh, you know, numbers, essentially like, you know, intensity values, pixel intensity values for a grayscale image, right? And don't take those numbers too literally. I didn't try too hard to make them correspond to that patch that I zoomed in on. So an image, right, for example, in the MNIST data set would be 28, which is the height in pixels, times 28, which is the width, uh, which is 784 dimensional. So there are 784 
dimensions to our input, right? So the example that I gave first had x1 and x2. Now we have x1, x2, x3, x4, so on and so forth, all the way up to x784, right? This is actually a really tiny image. So this is you know, an image that we might work with, but a somewhat larger image that we might work with could be, for example, 224 pixels in height and the same in width. And then actually it's a color image, so it has three color channels, RGB, right? And then all of a sudden, this thing blows up orders of magnitude to be over 150,000 dimensional, right? So there are many reasons why linear models don't you know, work so well in, in a lot of different applications. Uh, but one intuition that is useful to build is that the more higher dimensional your problem becomes, the less likely it is that your linear model is going to work particularly well, just due to the sheer fact that you have to fit all of these different parameters and the fact that these, you know, these different dimensions of your input probably don't have linear relationships between them. And so this linear model that we were talking about earlier, we can probably scratch that. Uh, it's probably not going to work particularly well when we have problems of this magnitude, of this dimension. And instead, in this class, we'll talk about you know, how we actually get to 0.5% uh, error rate uh, and what models are particularly good for these types of problems. Okay, so now let me zoom in a little bit more on this concept of training set versus test set. And then I'll also bring in the concept of, of a validation set. So training set error, right, roughly speaking, is what we train the classifier to minimize, right? So like I said before, we're learning or fitting the model on the training set. And in MNIST, for example, that's 60,000 image label pairs that we get. The test set error, in some sense, is actually what we, what we really care about. Uh, the test set error gives us an estimate of how well does the classifier actually generalize to new data. And the reason is because we didn't train or fit our model on the test set, right? So because we fit it on the training data, the training data can't tell us about generalization, but because we've never seen the test set when we were fitting the model, this will tell us something about generalization. And so this is what we end up really caring about. We have a concept in machine learning that's very important. It's called overfitting, uh, which is basically the idea that if your test set error is much greater than your training set error, well, then something funny happened, right? Uh, your model, uh, you know, learned how to do really, really well on these training examples, but it didn't really learn anything else. It didn't learn general rules or processes that it's going to be able to apply to new data in order to do well there, right? And so if that happens, if the test set error is greater than the training set error, or much greater, I should say, uh, then the classifier has overfit to the training set. And we really want to prevent this scenario because that's not a useful model. So overfitting in part can be combated uh, by doing something called holding out part of the training set. And what this means is we take a piece of the training set and we actually don't train on it. So in MNIST, we're given 60,000 training examples. It's pretty common actually to only train on 50,000 examples and then hold out 10,000 examples from the MNIST training set. Uh, and this ends up being called a validation set. So essentially we're validating whether or not our model is able to generalize or whether it's overfit to the part of the data that we trained on. Validation sets can be used to decide a number of things. Uh, so they can be used to decide when to stop training. So if I train for too long, then maybe my model will overfit to the data that I have, to the training data that I have. So I can try to stop at a point where my model has not yet overfit. Uh, or I can choose other types of hyperparameters, which are different from the parameters in the model because the parameters are learned or fit to the data, the hyperparameters are chosen by the human. That's why we call them hyperparameters. Uh, and an example of a hyperparameter might be, for example, how many neighbors do I use if I'm using a nearest neighbors classifier? Um, if, I, if I have a particular data set, maybe what I can do is I can fit a one nearest neighbor and a 15 nearest neighbor classifier uh, to both uh, both fit them both on the training set, and then I can evaluate how they do on validation sets. And then maybe if the 15 does much better than the one, that's an indication that 15 is a better hyperparameter to choose, uh, maybe because it overfits less or generalizes better to the to data that I haven't seen. And we'll talk a little bit more and give more examples about what training sets, test sets, and validation sets look like in this class.
So there's also another concept that's going to be important that will come up throughout the course, which is something that we call bias and variance. Uh, and there's a lecture later on where I'll explain why this is what I'm about to present is somewhat of a classical story that we don't totally believe anymore, uh, but it's still very useful to know about it uh, uh, because it plays a part in how we end up uh, you know, designing uh, and training machine learning models. So the basic idea of bias versus variance, right, is bias essentially is uh, on bias. The, the concept is on expectation, how far away are you from the correct answer? Um, variance is if I perform the same procedure multiple times, uh, you know, what's the spread of the uh, answers that pop out? from this procedure. So we can see here, you know, if I'm trying to hit a bullseye, um, then if I have high bias, you know, maybe I consistently hit something that's not the bullseye, right? So I'm, you know, pretty far off from the correct answer uh, in a systematic way. Whereas, vari whereas high variance might say something like, well, maybe I am actually close to the bullseye on expectation, so I have low bias, uh, but the spread is very large. Uh, and so I, you know, every time that I you know, run this procedure every time that I shoot an arrow, uh, I'm, I'm getting, you know, pretty variable answers, which is also not very desirable. So both bias and variance are bad. Uh, how they apply in the context of machine learning uh, is as follows. So when I say that my machine learning model has high bias, what I mean is that on expectation, it's not going to give me very good predictions. Uh, so even after I fit it on a bunch of training data, uh, maybe it's linear, right? So it doesn't have the capacity to represent the right answer. Or maybe there's something else going on. But basically, uh, it's not going to give me the right answer, the right label that I'm looking for, uh, even after I fit it on a bunch of data. Uh, on the other hand, if, my, if I'm talking about variance in machine learning, what I mean is that maybe I train a whole bunch of different models using the same procedure, like I fit a bunch of different nearest neighbors classifiers, and for some reason, they keep coming out different. So they give me different decision boundaries, and maybe on expectation, they all do pretty well, uh, but this variance is also not desirable because I want consistency. I want a procedure that gives me the same decision boundary or close to the same decision boundary over and over uh, because I don't want to, you know, I don't want the model that I get to depend on uh, you know, the, the data that I happen to, the, the training data that I happen to have. So both bias and variance are also, uh, you know, not very good when it, comes, when, when it comes to the concept or the context of machine learning. And there's a pretty classical story that we have told for decades in machine learning, which is something called the bias-variance trade-off, which is that um, based on how complex my model is, I might get lower bias, but I'll get higher variance. Um, and what is model complexity? It's basically what types of functions can my model represent using the parameters that it has, right? So a linear classifier has low complexity, uh, but a nearest neighbor classifier we might consider as having more complexity um, because, you know, as we get more and more data, the nearest neighbor's classifier can represent more and more different functions based on the data. Um, so typically what people have thought of is that as we increase model complexity, our bias goes down uh, because our model is able to represent the correct answer. So the variance goes up because we need more and more data in order to actually fit the model that we're looking for. And so if we don't have enough data, then every time we rerun this procedure for learning our model, we're going to come out with a different model. And maybe on expectation, that model is good, uh, but any random sample from that, any random sample of that procedure which generates a model uh, might come out poorly. And so uh, a lot of the times people have talked about this idea of there's got to be a sweet spot in the middle where we optimally trade off between bias and variance and therefore get a very good model that's somewhere in the middle between a very complex model and a very simple model. We'll talk a little bit about why we don't necessarily believe this story anymore. Uh, and part of the reason is because we can actually train extremely complex models like neural networks, uh, which presumably would have huge problems with variance, but for some reason don't. And we'll talk, we'll talk a little bit about why that might be uh, later on in the course. So we're almost out of time. So I just want to leave you a closing question, which we're going to talk about in various forms throughout the class. So we talked about, you know, examples like regression, classification. These are classical views of machine learning where basically the question is predict y from x. The real question that a lot of people in machine learning think about these days is what is x? 
So X we usually assume is something that's given to us, but it's given to us in what form? How, how are we provided X? Do we have to go and figure it out for ourselves? Or is this something that we can already use right out of the box that's going to be useful? Um, I won't answer this question today. We're also out of time. Uh, but it's something that we're going to revisit over and over in this class. So it's something that's good to keep in mind. Okay, so I will stop there. Uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, we'll pick back up with some math review on Friday. All right, thank you. Thank you. Oh, also, there, there was a question about 